Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive your word this night, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it, and we thank you it will bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of the revelation of the Father, and we talked about a lot this morning. We didn't get too far through Matthew, but we talked about a lot of things that are very important for you to realize. We're going to pick up here <coughs> in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, if he would trespass or might sin, this is talking about, because this doesn't mean that he's automatically going to do it, but again, it's a subjunctive mood, subjunctive mood meaning that if he might do it, if he might trespass against thee, what do you do? You're supposed to go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. That means we don't go and gossip and tell other people. We go and talk to them directly. Nobody particularly likes confrontation, but we need to confront people about when they have sinned against us. Now, this is talking about a brother. This isn't talking about somebody out there in the world. Can you expect anything from the world? No, you can't expect them to do the right thing. So don't think that you're going to get anywhere with them. But this is talking about a brother or sister in Christ. You're to go and tell them his fault against thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, then you've gained thy brother. Well, if he won't hear you, he won't listen, he won't get things right. Then take with you one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if you neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. <coughs> that means if he won't listen and repent, you treat him like he's not even a saved person. And this person will end up more or less not wanting, not continuing in fellowship. Then he goes on and says, Verily I say unto whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be, having been bound, literally, as we've seen in the other account over in Matthew 16, in heaven, in the heavens, whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed, shall be having been loosed in the heavens. This literally means. Now, why, why is this here? Because this is going to be used in you ministering to people. You're going to bind the demons that are in them. You're going to, people that the devil will try to keep them in the walking in their ways to abiding in sin so that they don't get reconciled unto you. And also, it says, again, I say unto you, if the two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask. The word ask is iteo, which means a demand of something due. We talked about this this morning. It shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. By the way, the traditional teaching on this is where two or three are gathered together. We know that God's automatically in the midst of us. No, it's not because two or three are gathered together. It's because of what you're doing. You're praying in the name of Jesus. That's why he's in the midst. Why does he come? Just because two or three are to gather together? If that's the case, he should be manifested himself every time two or three Christians get together. No, he manifests himself when you do things in his name. You see, you are going to pray to the Father again in the name of Jesus. And by the way, if you get anybody to pray with you, be sure that they're agreeing with you. The word is symphonio, from we get our word symphony which a symphony is where all the instruments are all on one accord and they're all bringing forth one sound. They all need to be in harmony. If you've got an instrument that's out of tune or off course, then you don't have a symphony. You don't have a good sound. Well, God wants us to be truly in agreement. Be sure that people that you're getting to pray, either with you or for you, are going to pray with you in agreement in line with the Word of God. You don't want them praying one thing and you're praying something else. Are your prayers going to get anywhere from agreement standpoint? No. You want to be sure they're praying the same thing. So give them the scriptures. Pray the word. Pray these scriptures. Here's the prayer that we're praying so that they will pray in agreement with you. And then you will see that I am in the midst when you pray in my name. That's what brings forth the manifestation of the presence of God. So we're going to learn to use our dominion and take the authority and pray to the Father and see God move to bring people to the place of restoration. After this, we see over in verse 21, where Peter said to Jesus, he said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him until seven times? Can I just do it seven times? No. Jesus said, I say not of these seven times, but until 70 times seven, essentially, perpetually. You don't keep track of all the times continually you're always to be ready to forgive a person. And he talks about down here, as he goes through after this, 
talking about the kingdom of heaven like to a certain king that took account of his servants. And he talks about the one who owed him this great debt of 10,000 talents. <clears throat> and uh, because he couldn't pay it, he was going to be sold, his wife, children, all that he had. This is all a type of the fact that you and I have had a, had a great debt of all the sin that we've committed. Could we pay all for all that? No, we couldn't do it. But he said, Lord, have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. Well, God ended up with compassion, loosed him and forgave him that debt. He forgave them all. God has forgiven us of all of our sins, hasn't he? Well, the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, loosed him, forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, owed him a hundred pence, small amount. All this type of the fact that here someone's done an evil thing to you. And he laid his hands on him and owed, took him by the throat and said, Pay me that thou owest. The fellow servant fell down at his feet, besought him, saying, Have patience with thee, and I'll pay thee all. It's the same thing he said to his Lord. Well, he would not. He wouldn't forgive him the debt. He went and cast him in the prison until he should pay the debt, because this is a parable, remember, showing something. And of course, the fellow servants saw what was done. They came and told their Lord all that was done. And he said, Oh, that wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldn't you have had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And the Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise, this parable, this is what it's pointing towards. It's talking about forgiveness still. Likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Your heavenly Father is not going to put up with unforgiveness in your heart. If you have unforgiveness in your heart, you will be turned to the tormentors. Who are that? That's the demons. The demons will have a right to come in, and they will cause all kinds of problems. Notice that you must forgive from your heart. It's got to be genuine. It can't be just going through the motions or doing it because I have to or ought to or just, you know, as my duty. It's got to be a genuine forgiveness from the heart. And this is talking about your brother, every single one, their trespasses. God wants us to be sure that we are forgiving every person. It doesn't matter what they've done to you. They may have done some very evil things to you, but you've got to do what God wants you to do. You're going to forgive that person regardless of what they've done because otherwise you're not forgiven of your sins, as we talked about. Over in Matthew chapter 20, talking about our Heavenly Father, down here in verse 23, here he said unto them, You shall drink indeed of my cup, be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand or on my left, this is Jesus speaking, is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. What does that tell you? Jesus is not the one who's making the decision of who's going to sit on his right hand or sit on his left. Who's making the decision? The Father. What does that tell you? We're talking about two different persons of the Godhead. This is a very clear illustration in the Word of God, the fact that the Father and the Son are two different persons of the Godhead. There are some out there that think that there's just one God. The Jews think that, and the, the, there's Christian groups out there that think that He's just one, and He's manifest with different titles. But that's not so. You can see it very clearly here. Jesus said, it's not mine to give. That's a person speaking. He says, it's prepared of my Father showing that the Father is a different person than Jesus. In Matthew chapter 23, over here in verse 8, he said, Be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. But we got two groups that have certainly have ignored this scripture, don't we? We got the Jews, who call rabbi, Talk, it's a title of honor addressing their teachers. For one is your master, even Christ. God doesn't want us to be giving others titles that belong to him. That means all the Jews that call someone rabbi, including all the Messianic Jews and their congregations, which have continued in the Old Testament ways, are in sin because they're not obeying the word of God. We don't want to address people by the titles. It says you're all brethren. You address someone by their name or by their brother or sister, so and so. So the Jews and the Messianic group, they've missed it big time, haven't they? And then verse 9, this is speaking about the Catholics. Call no man your father upon the earth. What do they address their, their, their heads of their particular uh, parishes and so forth? 
father so and so. Are you supposed to call, and it's referring to, remember, a spiritual thing, not talking about your own physical father. It's talking about uh, from a spiritual title. Do you address anybody as, quote, father? No. There's one as your father, which is in heaven. We should never be addressing anybody by that type of a title. I don't care if they come to you and say that's what their name is. I'm not going to address them back that way. I'm going to address them by, you know, what their first name is or whatever all. I want you to know that we have a big problem in the body of Christ. It is, wasn't this way in years past, and it wasn't this way in the Word of God. In the Word of God, nobody addressed anybody by their title before their name. You don't find it anywhere in the Bible where it was Apostle Paul, or Prophet so-and-so, or, or the, you know, this pastor so-and-so, or whatever. They didn't address them by the name of their title first. They didn't address them that way. Instead, they just, it says, when it talks about Paul, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, or Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And any time they addressed the person, they addressed them as their name. Or they might have addressed them as brother so-and-so. As Ananias said, brother Saul. You speak about brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. What do we see it happen in the past? People didn't do these kind of things until recently. It's been in the recent 20, 30 years that the body of Christ has wanted to exalt themselves in the ministry and take on their titles. And now you have everybody out there that has a title. They want their titles. And so they tout their titles everywhere they go. That's not good. Who is the one who is our teacher, our master, the one who is the head? It is the Father, and it is Jesus teaching us. They're the ones that get all the honor and the glory. Yes, it's nothing wrong with acknowledging someone's, someone's ministry, but at the same time, to have their title before is not a good thing, as God says. That's why people, I've had people say, well, what shall we call you? My name is Dave. You can call me Dave, or you can call me Brother Dave, or whatever. That's really what you should be addressing me as. Now, if you want to call me pastor, that's up to you. Would I ever tell you to do that? Never, because I don't see it in the Word of God. Just call me by my name or by brother so-and-so. That's the way everybody did it in the past, and that really is the scriptural way of addressing people. We just call them by their name or brother so-and-so. And there's nothing wrong with acknowledging their ministry, that they're such-and-such. But we don't play the, quote, title game. Because really, it's really puffing up men and given the, taking the glory away from the Lord. We see in Matthew chapter 24, in verse 36. Of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, of heaven, but the Father only. This is talking about the time when he's going to come back. Does anybody know the day and hour exact one? No. Does Jesus know it? No. Do the angels know it? No. Who knows it? Oh, the Father only. Does Jesus know, Jesus know it? No. This is also another proof of scripture to show you the fact that there isn't just a, quote, oneness of God. It's very clearly. Jesus out of his own, you know, Jesus saying, hey, he didn't know it. Angels don't know it. No man knows it. And he's the man Christ Jesus. Who knows the day and hour? The Father, because that's talking about a different person. These are important scriptures so people don't get in error and think, understand, they fail to understand the Godhead of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, three persons of the Godhead. We see in Matthew 25, verse 31, here's where the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. They'll sit upon the throne of his glory. He's going to gather all the nations, separate them as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He's going to set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. And they'll say to the king, he'll say to them, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That shows you the ones who are really walking with him, the sheep, are the ones that have been blessed of the father. That means they have developed a personal relationship with him. They pray to him. They've seen the blessings of the father come upon them in their life. The blessings of the father. They are going to inherit the kingdom prepared from them from the foundation of the world. He said, when I was a hungry, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him and say, Lord, when saw we and they hungered, fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? 
When Saul with thee a stranger took thee in naked or clothed thee, and when Saul with thee sick or in prison and came unto thee, the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren. He's speaking about those that are his, he considers his brethren. You've done it unto me. When you have done it to the, those who are his brethren, you've done it unto the Lord. Now what's he say to the next group? The guys on the left hand, he says, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting, everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. These guys are finished. For I was a hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, took me not in. Naked, you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord. They called him Lord, too. I'm not talking about somebody out there in the world. This is someone who called him Lord. Yet, so we saw the hungry, or thirst, or stranger, or naked, sick, or in prison, did not minister unto thee. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch as you did it not unto one of the least of these, you did it not to me. You didn't do it. Now this time, he notice he changed. He didn't say to my brethren. He said, you didn't do it one of the least of these. <clears throat> you did it not unto me. And so what happens to these guys? These ones shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. They're in the life eternal. That shows the fact that those the ones of the sheep are the ones that are following him, obeying him, and doing what he says. They're going to be the righteous. Who are the goats? The goats are the ones who wander off, do their own thing, don't do what he says. Those are the ones that are not considered righteous, and they are going to go into everlasting punishment. That is quite a statement. We see over in Matthew 26 something more about the Father. Down here in verse 29. I say unto you, I'll not drink henceforth this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it with new with you in my Father's kingdom. Notice the kingdom was given in the hands of Jesus, but you know it's going to be turned back into the hands of the Father when everything has been finished and all the works have been accomplished. And he says this over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that the Father gave the kingdom into the hands of Jesus, but it's going to be returned back to the Father. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, Then come at the end when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. When the end comes, it's going to be returned unto the Father because it was the Father's kingdom that he had and he gave unto Jesus. Back over in Matthew, in 26, as we mentioned, time and time again, and we give you these scriptures to show you, as we already saw, we don't pray to Jesus, we pray to the Father in the New Testament. Here's Jesus when he was at the garden before he go into cross, and he's praying to the Father continually. We see again, praying to, O oh, my Father, the way that Jesus would pray was to the Father because that's the way you and I are going to pray when we have relationship to Him in the New Testament. So you're going to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. You want to get an audience with God? Do what He says according to His Word. and You're going to pray the Word and He is going to respond. Here we see something else. Matthew 26, 53, Jesus said, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father and He shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Otherwise, you can pray to the Father and He will give angels to come on the scene to minister on your behalf. Well, if Jesus could do that, can you and I do the same thing? Sure we can. We now can pray to the Father in the name of Jesus for Him to give, presently give you as many angels as are necessary to come on the scene to minister in the situation that you are dealing with to deal with the enemy's works operating either directly at you or drop operating through people. So, pray to the Father. Put the angels in operation. Don't sit there and think that the angels are automatically doing things. No, Jesus needed to pray in order to see them come on the scene to minister in the situations that he was in. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it says, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. This is talking about acknowledging that we come into the Godhead relationship. We've come into relationship with the Godhead because that's what baptism was all about, remember? Baptism, we taught you about that. Baptism is how they came in, this first step <clears throat> of how they came into the priesthood in the Old Testament where they were washed and they had the anointing and the application of the blood. In like manner, we now, when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, 
we come into the priesthood through spiritual birth, and we now have come into relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And what else are we to do? Teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. So when you baptize people, by the way, we combine what's in the book of Acts, baptized in the name of Jesus, which you do everything in the name of Jesus, and also acknowledging that we come into the relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Therefore, when we baptize people, we baptize people in the name of Jesus, into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, acknowledging that we've come into relationship with the Godhead. Praise God. And we did that not too long ago when we had bap water baptism. In Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 8, talking about the Father, in verse 8, he says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. We can't be ashamed of the Word of God, which is the words that Jesus received from the Father and brought to us. <clears throat> if so, we'll be, we'll be, he'll be ashamed of us. And he says he's going to come in the glory of his Father. In the understanding the working of the Godhead, the chain of command goes from the Father to Jesus to the Holy Spirit. That's the way it always works in the chain of command. They are all one in unity as to relationship, but they are with each other in, in that, and, but they are saying there is a chain of command coming from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit, and we see this constantly through the Scriptures. We also see another thing, that when you're praying over in Matthew, Mark, Mark chapter 11, down here in verse 25, when he said, When you stand praying, if you have aught against any, that your Father also, in, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. You've got to forgive. Forgive every person. As we've already pointed out, that scripture. If you don't forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Remember, forgiveness is mandatory. It doesn't matter what people have done to you. You've got to make a decision from God's standpoint to forgive at the point of your will. We see something else in Mark chapter 13 that's interesting in verse 32, because we already pointed out about in Matthew 24, 36 about you won't know the day or the hour. Look what's added in this verse. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Neither the Son wasn't put in the other one. But this even makes it clearer that the differences in the persons of the Godhead. This should help you if you have heard of or have been taught of the oneness type of a persuasion, the fact that there is only one God, that he's only one person. This is very clear, that the Son does not know, yet the Father does know, clearly showing that there is a difference in the persons of the Godhead. Mark chapter 14, down in verse 36, he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto you. Abba, was the sacred Chaldee proper name of the Father in Chaldee. That's where it came from. And it den denotes intimate relationship with the Father. So he called out to Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. And you must realize that he is who now you have a personal intimate fellowship with once you come in the place of being born again. We see some other places where Abba is used in Romans chapter 8, down here in verse 15, where he says, you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, when we get born again, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, you have relationship to God, you've been adopted in, he's now your heavenly father. Now, you may not have had a very good relationship with your earthly father. Don't think of your heavenly father in relationship to the way it was with your earthly father. Get your eyes on the, what the Word says. Your Heavenly Father is a loving Heavenly Father that wants to bless you and wants to develop a personal, intimate fellowship with you. At the same time, you've come in a covenant relationship and He expects you to take hold of what He says and walk in the light of it. We see another place over in Galatians chapter 4 in verse 6 speaking about Abba where it says, Because your sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father, again. That also tells you what you get when you're born again. What do you get when you're born again? The Spirit of His Son. Is that the Holy Spirit? No. This is another proof scripture to show people the fact that you didn't get the Holy Spirit when you got born again. What'd you get? 
you got the spirit of his son, which comes from Jesus, which is the spirit of Jesus Christ. Remember that the Holy Spirit is received after or subsequent to salvation. Another thing when it refers to the Father, referring to the Father, there's times when it refers to him as the highest or the most high God. He is, in remember, in the relationship of the chain of command, he is the most high of the three persons of the Godhead. It says here in Luke 132, he'll be great, he'll be called the son of the highest. The highest is the father, who has, is the highest in relation in the Godhead. He has the preeminence. We, even the demons knew this. Over in Mark, Mark chapter 5, see these demons, remember they were fallen angels. They knew everything about the way the Godhead was set up. Mark chapter 5, verse 7, Here's the demon speaking to Jesus. He said, Jesus, thou son of the most high God. They knew who the father was. He was the most high God. And we see the fact that it's, he's called often about the highest or referred to as the most high God. And of course, we see the fact that where is he? His throne is in heaven. As we see in Acts chapter 7, in verse 48, where is the father? So how be it the Most High, that's the Father, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Where is he dwelling? He's dwelling in heaven. What house will you build me, saith the Lord, and what is the place of my rest? So where is God the Father dwelling? He's dwelling in heaven, praise God. He is the Most High God. Now in Luke chapter 2, we see something. Luke chapter 2. Pick up over in verse 48. This is when G Jesus stayed behind. Remember when he was sitting in the midst of the doctors, hearing them and asking them questions. This is when he was only 12 years old. And they were astonished at his understanding of his answers. When they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why hast thou just dealt with us? Behold, I want you to notice what he, she said. Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Was Joseph his father? No. You know, Jesus corrected her. He corrected her in his next statement. He said, said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wished you not know that I must be about my father's business? Correcting her. That shows the fact that she didn't have it all together, did she? No. Jesus, Joseph was not the father. Jesus, his father, was the father in heaven. And he, of course, was about the Father's business. Well, also, we've got to realize that you and I are to be about the Father's business. What is the Father's business for you in your life? It's for you to go and preach the gospel and share the word with others and minister the power of God, healing, deliverance, do the mighty works of the Lord. Be out there preaching the gospel. Remember, you're not of this world. You're citizens of heaven. And you are ambassadors for Christ. You've been sent forth to minister to people, to be reconciled unto God. You and I have a ministry, and we have a purpose here. Not, don't get comfortable here and just think about just living my life here in the world. You've got to realize you are not from this world. You are born from above. And you now have a ministry that God wants to operate through you. You need to be about the, master, the Father's business. In Luke chapter 6, Verse 36, something else we see about the Father you need to know. He's not some hard taskmaster. It says in Luke 6, 36, Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. You've got to know that your Heavenly Father is merciful. He's ready to forgive. He's ready to minister to the needs in your life. He's ready to heal and deliver and restore. He's not a hard taskmaster whatsoever. Maybe you had a father that was real hard and kind of, you know, not very merciful. That's not your Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father is merciful, praise God. We see another scripture, just to help you, again, in Luke chapter 9, verse 26, about seeing the difference in the Godhead. We bring these out to really help you, because there's many out there that have been deceived, thinking that there's only one God. Luke 9, 26, Whoever shall be ashamed of me and my words of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes and this Jesus is going to come in his own glory. There's a glory of Jesus. And in his Father's, there's the, Father, the, of the, the Father's glory, and there's also a glory of the holy angels. They all have glory. They're all separate. He's talking to the angels are separate from Jesus. 
who is separate from our Heavenly Father. Praise God. Now another scripture we see over in Luke chapter 11, verse 13. When we are born again, and we, especially when you lead someone to be born again, what should you do right away? After they're, you get them born again, immediately take them to receive the Holy Spirit. Don't just get them born again and just leave them hanging and think, well, well, we'll teach them about that later. That's a mistake. You, they, they might end up getting around some people that say, oh, you already got it, the whole package. You don't need to receive the Holy Spirit. And then you haven't done what you need to do. When you lead a person to be born again, pray in a prayer to receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, then immediately take them into a prayer to receive the Holy Spirit. Tell them about that. That's important. Luke eleven thirteen 13 is a prayer that you can pray. If you then be an evil and how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Because where does the Holy Spirit come from? He comes from the Father. And so you now, as a believer, are going to address your heavenly Father to give you the Holy Spirit. And by the way, this is part of your rights in Christ because it's the Greek word, ateo, remember, which means a demand of something do you. In fact, you want to see that. This is where this number 154 means, as we pointed out, this is Strong's Concordance in the Lightning Bible program. It reproduced here exactly what's like in the written Strong's Concordance. And number 154, I tell you, means a demand of something due. We are making a legal demand of what's due us. What's, what's the demand that we make due us? For him to give us the Holy Spirit. Now, it is the promise of God. It's the promise of the Holy Spirit that we can receive. And it come, it's the promise of the Father it's referred to in the Word of God. So, you and I are to come to our Heavenly Father, lead a person to receive the Holy Spirit. Just simply lead him in a prayer, just acting like this. Heavenly Father, I ask you to get, I make a dem demand before you. I don't explain that to him particularly. But I come to receive the Holy Spirit. I receive the Holy Spirit to come and dwell on the inside of me. Lead him in a prayer to receive the Holy Spirit. Praise God. We also see another scripture over in Luke chapter 12. You've got to understand that the kingdom, remember, that you have been given, as it says here in Luke 12, 31, he said, Rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Remember, the kingdom that Jesus has been given has come first from the Father. So it's the Father's good pleasure. He wants you to have the kingdom, and you come into what? The kingdom of his dear Son when you get born again. So the Father gave the kingdom to Jesus, and he wants you to come into that same kingdom. The Father's good pleasure is to give you the kingdom. He wants you to have that. And what's the kingdom? The position of ruling and reigning. You are to come into the place of realizing that you're to rule and reign. You know, some Christians are very timid about taking their place and ruling and reigning and realizing they have dominion. And they're to command the work of his hands. And they're to make these demands of what's due them. And that they are to take dominion, to bind, to loose, to cast out, throw down, root out, resist, speak to mountains, and destroy the works of the enemy. God's good pleasure is to give you the kingdom, and he wants you to take your rightful place and operate in the kingdom. Praise God. We see another interesting scripture in Luke 22, verse 29, where it says, I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father has appointed unto me. Otherwise, Again, where did he get the kingdom from? The Father. See how it comes down the chain of command? And then now what's he doing? He's appointing unto us a kingdom so that you and I enter into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now, another thing. We already talked about forgiving. But here's a case where Jesus was on the cross. And in Luke 23, verse 34, look what Jesus said. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. These are the ones that were putting them on the cross. Again, what was his attitude? He always wanted to see the Father's will be done. And so he's coming to the Father to forgive them. The Father is always ready to do his word. Our Heavenly Father is a forgiving God. Don't ever think that God won't forgive you. Have you had areas where you've had in, in sin or areas maybe where you keep tripping up in sin? Always go to the Father and confess your sin and receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteous. He's always ready to forgive you. Don't ever Sit there and wallow in your sin or think that God's going to condemn you. Condemnation is, comes from the devil. The devil. Jesus, you know, he said, I don't condemn you to that woman. He said, go and sin no more. 
He just calls us to repentance. He is ready to forgive you. He wants you to start walking in the ways of the Lord. We see another thing. In Luke 23, 46, talking about the Father. This is Jesus on the cross. When he cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend, or this means to entrust my spirit. Having said thus, he gave up the ghost, or commit, or to entrust my spirit. He entrusted his spirit into the hands of the Father. Well, if Jesus entrusted his hands and his spirit in the hands of the Father. Can't we trust everything in the hands of the Father when we pray? Absolutely. You need to realize that you now can pray to the Father. You can pray the Word of God. You can entrust everything that you have into the hands of the, that the Father is going to do what is right. He's going to bring forth His promises in your life. He's going to show forth His mercy and His blessing coming on, your, on you. And His angels are going to go forth and they're going to minister unto you and bring forth His promises in your life. Luke 24. We told you about the Holy Spirit being the promise of the Father. Here's the scripture that says it. Luke 24, 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. That's the Holy Spirit. They were supposed to wait in the city of Jerusalem till this promise of the Father. You've got to realize that this is one of the promises of God that belongs to us. Praise God. Now, over in John, we see a lot of uses in John of scriptures that talk about the Father. In fact, we even see in verse 14 there, when the Word was made flesh and He dwelled among us, we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Jesus had the glory of the Father that was manifest in Him. Down in verse uh, 18, no man seen God at any time. The only begotten Son was the bosom of the Father. He had declared Him. See, the Father is a loving Heavenly Father. And his glory was manifest in Jesus. And you know what? He wants his glory manifest in us. That's the presence of God to be manifest in our life. See, we've got to get rid of this attitude that the Father is some distant God that we can't come nigh to and can't develop a personal, intimate fellowship with him. That is a lie. No. We are to realize that we're to come into a fellowship with him. In John chapter 2, interesting statement that Jesus makes. He says, take these things hence, when he was driving out the money changers out of the temple, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. He called the temple his father's house. Well, who's the temple of God today? You and I are. You've got to realize you, the temple of God, are really the father's house. He has come to dwell in you. By the, he sent his spirit into you. The Holy Spirit has come to dwell in you once you're born again. It's the Spirit of the Father, and that's the way He manifests Himself in your life. That's why, as you get the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you're going to see that you're going to develop a real, personal, intimate fellowship with the Father, <clears throat> as you do what the Word says. We see over in John chapter 3, verse 35, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Well, He'll do the very same thing. He loves you, and He will give everything that belongs to you in covenant relationship into your hand. We should never think for a minute that the Father is going to hold anything back. See, He's a good Heavenly Father. Your Father might have, in the earth might not have done very good for you, but your Heavenly Father, He will always do good for you. John chapter 4, verse 21. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, and the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. What do we just give worship to? We're supposed to worship the Father. We also can worship Jesus. So that's okay to worship Him. He's God. He said here in verse uh, uh, 23, He says, The hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers, that means there's some that aren't really true worshipers, or some that are just carrying, carrying out religious worship. But we're talking about the true worshipers are going to worship the Father. They're going to worship the Father in spirit. That means not in the flesh. We see a lot of things that go on in the body of Christ as a bunch of fleshly worship. It's not spiritual worship. It's not coming from the Spirit, which has got to be in line with the Word of God. It's some of the flesh. They do these fleshly things. They're not going to bring you into the manifest presence of God. The flesh isn't going to do it. It's what you do in the Spirit that's going to bring forth the manifest presence of God. And also in truth, which means it's going to be according to the Word. So when we worship the Father, that means every song we sing has got to be in line with the Word. Because if we're doing it in truth, what's the truth? The Word of God. 
So we're going to be sure that we don't have fleshly means of worship, or we aren't going to be doing anything or singing words contrary to the Word of God. That's not going to be received as the Father with worship. Notice that the Father seeketh such to worship Him. And this word seeking means He's continually seeking those who will worship Him. See, God really wants you to enter in to worshiping the Father. When we're singing these songs and singing praise unto Him, singing the words as important as you're thinking about all the things that are being said, at the same time, when there's a time for you to spontaneously praise and worship Him, between like sets of songs when we would stop, those are times for you to bring spontaneous praise and worship out of your mouth. Don't just sit there and do nothing. Verbalize praise and worship and give it unto, out of your heart on the inside of you. Minister unto Him. Worship unto the Father. Just whatever would come out of your own heart in ministering to Him. That's going to make the Father's heart glad. As you minister, he's hearing things come forth out of you as you are worshiping him. He seeks for such to worship him. And he says, God's a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him. The word must is it's necessary as binding. It's actually a covenant word. It's necessary as binding that you worship him in spirit and in truth. God wants you to get to the place where you have real liberty in ministering unto him. You're not rigid. You're not held back. God wants you to worship with your whole spirit, soul, and body and minister unto the Lord with everything within you, and worship the Lord, especially worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth. We see something else in John chapter 5, verse 17, talking about the Father. Jesus said, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Because everything that Jesus did, all the works, He didn't do it in His own ability. Hey, in fact, He didn't do it in His own name. We even see in John chapter 10, verse 25, he said, I told you that you believe not the works that I do in my Father's name. He did the works in his Father's name. He didn't do the works in his own name. Now in the New Covenant, you and I do the works in Jesus' name. And so just as the Father and Jesus were working together, you and I are working together with Jesus now. And of course, the Father operating through the Spirit. So they're all involved as you and I are going forth doing the mighty works of the Lord. Praise God. We see further in John, John chapter 5, down here in verse 19, where Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, a son can do nothing of himself. He didn't have the power to do anything of himself. You know, a lot of people think, well, Jesus was God and he was going around doing all these works himself. That's not true. Jesus did nothing of himself. He was totally yielded to obey the Father, and it was the Father dwelling in him that did the works. But he, what he sees the Father do, in other words, whatever he saw the Father doing is what went, he went out to do, and the Father was revealing these things to him. For what things, whatever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Well, in like manner, you and I, the Father was the express image, as Jesus was the express image of the Father, and so whatever you see Jesus doing is what the Father was doing, so when you see what Jesus was doing, that's what the Father was doing, they're both doing it, and you take hold of it and do it, then you're going to be carrying out the same works and doing the things that you see the Father and Jesus doing because he carried out the things of the Father. We see in verse 20, For the Father love of the Son shows him all things that himself do it. Well, that means the Father didn't hold anything back, showed him everything he do. Well, what will he do for us? Won't the Father show us all the things that we need to do? So he shows us how to do all the works of God, shows us how to cast out the demons, how to go forth and minister to people and set people free from bondages? Of course. He'll show them greater works than these that you may marvel. You see, but you got, you know, I want, well, I want to see all these things. Well, why don't you get doing things that he wants you to do now, and guess what? He'll advance you along as you go. I mean, you got to start somewhere. So start doing the works of God. Are you involved in casting out demons out of people? Well, God wants you to be, not just receiving it for yourself. He wants to put you to work. He wants to see you guys be put to work, you know, put you to work. When you come into the deliverance room, it's, it's about time for some, some of you are interested in doing that, I know. It's about time some of you get to put, be put into operation for you start ministering deliverance to other people. You can do the same mighty works. And as you develop yourself in ministering deliverance, God will raise you up to be strong in the Lord. And he'll start showing you and you'll be doing the things that he wants you to do. In fact, we even see, as the Father raised the dead and quickens them, so the Son quickens whom he will. 
That shows you the fact that he was raising the dead. And doesn't the Bible say that he sent the disciples out not only to cast out devils and heal the sick, but also to raise the dead? See, we got a lot to develop in so that we can see the mighty works of God done. Just think of a body of believers that are being raised up, that are bringing healing and bringing deliverance, and the dead are being raised. Hey, that's going to that's gonna be notable miracles that are going to happen that are going to just bring forth great move of people coming to the Lord because they see the mighty works of the Lord being done. Praise God. We see something else. The Father judges no man, but he's committed all judgment unto the Son. Your Heavenly Father is not the one who's gonna, is judging. Jesus is the one who is carrying out the judgment. All men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. And if you don't honor the Father, you're not going to see his blessings come forth. Well, you've got to honor Jesus. How do you honor Jesus? When you honor his word, because Jesus and the word are one. So what you do with the word is whether you're honoring Jesus or not, and if you don't honor Jesus with the word, then you don't honor the Father. That's why it says, if you don't confess Jesus before men, you'll be denied before the Father. We read that in Matthew chapter 10 earlier uh, this morning. Important that what you do with Jesus is important because you're honoring the Father as well. We also see over in John chapter 5, another scripture to show you the fact that Jesus didn't do anything of himself. John 5.30, he said, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. That tells you something else. You want to see yourself develop a personal intimate fellowship with the Father? Don't seek your own will. How can you know what the Father wants you to do if you're seeking what you want to do? That's why Jesus said, if any man come after me, what's the first thing he said? Deny himself. You've got to deny yourself. That's going to be the first step towards you moving towards developing personal relationship with the Father. I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. So what does God want you to do? Deny yourself. Seek the will of the Father. How do we know the will of the Father? It's the Word of God. The Word of God that He wants you to do. We also see in verse 36, there's much said through John about relationship with the Father. In verse 36, I have greater witness than it of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness to me that the Father hath sent me. He went forth and he was doing the works of the Father. And he says that the Father himself who sent me has borne witness of me. He was bearing witness. You've never heard, you neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. But Jesus, of course, seen him. But he took everything that the Father told him to do and went forth and did the mighty works of the Lord, of the Father, the Father. Verse 43, I'm come in my Father's name. He didn't come in his own name. And you receive me not. If another come in his own name, him will you receive. So we need to come now in the New Testament, we come in Jesus' name. And we're coming in Jesus' name. We're doing the same thing that what he was doing, coming in his Father's name. And of course, remember that this Father has given the kingdom into the hands of Jesus. That's why you come in Jesus' name, because that's bringing the kingdom into manifestation. Praise God. Now we also see another scripture down here in John chapter 6. We pick up in verse 32. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Who's that? Jesus. And how is that manifest for you today? Through the Word. This is why the bread from heaven that is going to minister to you, that's going to be life to you, that's going to strengthen you, that's going to feed you, that's going to empower you, it's the Word of God. What you're doing with the Word of God is what you're doing with Jesus, which is what the Father has given unto you. We need to be in the Word continually. Verse 37, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. That's the attitude you ought to have. Everything that the Father, all the promises of God, they're to come to me. Don't sit there and think that, well, I don't know if I can enter, enter into all these promises. Many Christians have such a low level of belief of what God will do for them. Oh, I hope he'll do this, or I hope he'll do that, or maybe he'll do this for me. That's not what the attitude you should have. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and to him that cometh to me I'll no wise cast out. He's talking about all the people that came to him that, he was gonna, that were going to come and receive him and be saved. But everything that the Father gives you, he wants you to receive it. 
He wants you to enter in to all the things that he's given unto you. In fact, we even see going on down here, he says, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Where have you come from? Heaven, that's where your spirit's from. What have you come to do? The will of him that sent you. That's why we got to get ministry minded. We got to get minded of what the Father wants us to do. One of the reasons the body of Christ is not really grown up in the way they should is because they're not ministry minded. They're not tuned in to what their, actually their purpose is. They think of themselves here and they just want to get all their blessings here and they're kind of living their life in the earth instead of realizing that they're an ambassador from heaven. They're a citizen of heaven and they're to go forth and do the works that he's called them to do. Praise God. So you don't get comfortable in this place. This is the Father's will which has sent me. And of all that which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but it should raise it up again at the last day. That shows you the fact that Jesus didn't lose anybody that was given to him. Although, remember, we saw that scripture this morning that people can destroy themselves. And that's how they end up turning away from the Lord, because they actually destroy themselves. We see over here in verse 44 as we go through John 6. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. It says, they shall all be taught of God. Every man here, therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. So how is the Father going to draw people to Jesus? Through learning the, what's the word of the Father, which is what? The word of God. That's why, what do you need to do? You need to teach people the word. When you go to preach the gospel to people, give them the word of God. Tell them the truth of the word of God. That, so that they, as they're taught and they learn of these things of the Father, then those are the ones that will come unto Jesus. And they, of course, then will get born again. Praise God. Now we see further, he talks also down in verse 64, more. He says, these are some, there's some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Therefore I said unto you that no man can come unto me except that were given unto him of my Father. Now, what's going to stop a person from coming into Jesus? They're going to have to believe. As you sow the word of the Father in them, they're only going to come to Jesus if they believe the word from the Father and they act upon it. Again, how is the Father going to draw people? Through the word. How's the word going to get to them? You're going to go and preach it. How are they going to come to Jesus? They're going to believe the word that he acts upon, he brings forth. Many people are praying for the Father to draw them to so forth. Well, what they need to be doing is getting the word out to the people, so that's what the Father's going to use to draw them unto Jesus. People haven't looked at these scriptures to see how the Father draws people unto himself, unto the Lord to be born again. In John chapter 8, verse 16, he says, You judge after the flesh, I judge no man. If I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. Another good proof scripture to show you that the Father and Jesus are different. He says, I'm not alone. What well, would mean one person? I am the Father and the sent me. That's talking about two persons, isn't it? That also helps us to understand the lies that are taught out there in the oneness type of teaching. It's also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Why is he bringing that forth? Because he's talking about the Father and Jesus. I'm one that bears witness of myself, and the Father that sent me bears witness of me. We're talking about two persons of the Godhead. Praise God. We even see over in John chapter 28, verse 26, many things he says. He says, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then Jesus unto him, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you'll know that I'm he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Again, what do we see here over and over and over? He does nothing of himself. What is going to be the key for you to come to the place of being able to accomplish the things that God wants? You've got to come to the place of total denial of self. As long as you're calling the shots, you've stopped the works of the Father from being able to manifest through you. You've got to deny yourself. Put the Word of God first place. Start doing what He says. 
the Father is going to use you mightily through the Lord Jesus Christ to accomplish all of his great and mighty works. Praise God. And remember, as we pointed out this before, but bring the scripture up again, how did Jesus do the works? He didn't do it himself. So many people out there think that Jesus did everything whenever he wanted to do it just by his own power, whenever at his will. That's not so. The works that I do in my Father's name, he did nothing in his own name. He did everything of the Father. Now we see a scripture over here in verse 28 where it says that I give them eternal life, they'll never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. That's talking about the person of the Father and two people. I and my Father are one. Now this doesn't mean that they're the same person. It means that they're in unity together, but we know that they're two different people because the Father gave them me and no man's able to pluck the, out of the Father's hand. That talks about there's the Father and there's also Jesus. Another thing that we see in John chapter 12, down here in verse 26. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. In, relation, in developing a personal relationship with the father, it all comes down to what you do with Jesus. This is why taking hold of the things of Jesus and the word of God is so important for you in your life. As you do that, then your father is going to honor you. In other words, you're going to, whatever you do with Jesus, is going to cause the Father's relationship or reaction to you in your life. Everything is to the Father. Father, glorify thy name. Then came their voice from heaven saying, I both glorified it and will glorify it again. He was carrying on an intimate personal fellowship with them. See, God wants you to understand that you can come to the place of developing a personal intimate fellowship with the Lord. And you can hear his voice. and You can have communion with him. We see over in John chapter 14, verse 2, In my Father's house, where's that? In heaven, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. That's right. He's got places, dwelling places for you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's right. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And he's going to come. That where I am, now this is a problem that people have not understood. They think there you may be also thinking it's talking about in heaven. There is not in the translation. Notice it's italicized. It was added by the translator. Literally it says that where I am you may be also. He's going to receive us unto himself. And when's he going to receive us unto himself? When he comes back and we're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. We're going to be caught up to meet him. And then we'll be with him wherever he is. But he goes to prepare a place for us. And he's going to come again. What's that talking about? The second coming of Jesus Christ when he's going to come again. And he's going to receive you, take us unto himself. And we are going to be with the Lord. That's what's going to happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's prepared something for us. He's going to come and we're going to be received of, of, the, of the Lord. Now here's a scripture in John 14, 26. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Again, how are we coming? We're coming through every... How's, how's the chain of command? It's coming through Jesus to the Father. This is why when we pray, why do we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus? You've got to come through the high priestly ministry of Jesus. That's why you do everything in the name of Jesus. A lot of people think, why do we do everything in the name of Jesus? Because you've got, that's the only way the chain of command in the new covenant, in the way covenant relationship is established in order to come to the Father. That's why they had the priests, the high priest, and then they had the priests. The priests always came through the high priest when they were coming to God. In like manner, that's the ministry of Jesus. He's the high priest over this covenant. So no man comes unto the Father but by me. Again, hearing the word of God and what you do with Jesus is the key. At the same time, we see a scripture down here in, chapter, in verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? How was that? 
because of the Spirit of the Father that came to dwell in him, and because of the words of the Father that came to dwell in him. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. Otherwise, he didn't remember. The word that he's speaking, did he get it of himself? No, he got it from the Father. Just like the Holy Spirit, when he speaks things, did he get it of himself? No, he got what he received from above, and he shows them unto us. Again, we're trying to help you to see and from the Word of God, the divine connection and the command, chain of command from the Father to the Son to Jesus. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. And it's going to be the same thing through the Word of God and through the Spirit of the Father. Because how did Jesus do the works? By the Spirit of God. What's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father that proceeds from him. And we'll get to that scripture here in just a minute, and you'll see that. Then he goes on and says, Believe me that I'm in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Otherwise, how could I do this if it wasn't the Father doing it? How are you going to do the works? You're going to do it through the working of the name of Jesus and the kingdom, and through the Word of God that you're acting upon, which is coming from Jesus, which is also coming from the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto he that believeth in me, the works that I do shall he do also. The greater works, or more in quantity, this talks about, than these shall you do, because I go unto my Father. Well, he's gone to the Father, and who's the representative in the earth now? You and I are. You and I are his representative. You and I are his body. He's the head, and you are members of the body, and you're important. And he wants to use you. You've got to get this mentality. I can cast out demons, I can heal the sick, I can set the captives free, I can do the mighty works, I can take dominion in the realm of the Spirit, I can destroy the works of the devil. We've got to get that mentality of what God wants to do in our lives. Praise God. That's why he says, whatsoever you shall ask, I tell you, make a demand to what's due you. In my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Who's performing the word? Jesus as he's taking that word and bringing it to the Father, who's going to release the promises, and also he confesses it before the angels that go forth to carry out the word of God in our life. We see another scripture over in verse 16. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Did Jesus have the Holy Spirit? No. He had to pray the Father. The Father is the one who had the Holy Spirit and gave him to him that he comes and abides on the inside of us. And you'll see further when we get over to John 15 in a moment. We see down here in John 14, 20, at that day you shall know that I'm in the Father and you in me and I in you. You see, the Godhead is coming to dwell in you. Remember what it talks about? Being baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That is speaking of the fact that you and I now come into relationship with the entire Godhead. You are to have relationship with the Father and with the Son and with the Holy Spirit. And there he says, he that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loveth me. Again, that's the word of God, isn't it? And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. That means what you're doing with Jesus, the word, is going to then determine what the Father is going to do. See the chain of command again? We've seen it multiple times, haven't we? As those that love me, that's the word, you're going to be loved to the Father. I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Then he says, if a man love me, he'll keep my words, and my Father will love him. Now, otherwise, in the measure you love Jesus by keeping his words is the measure that the Father is going to be manifesting his love to you. We will come and make our abode with him. That is the Father and Jesus showing up and manifesting themselves in your life. And that's exactly what he wants to do in us. Verse 26, we see further. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. You say, I thought it was Jesus who did it. It's actually the Father was sending it. Jesus was simply the means whereby it came through. He got it from the Father, but where did it ultimately come from? The Father. And what's the Holy Spirit, who's the Spirit of the Father? What's He come to do? He's come to teach you all things, which means He's going to teach you all the things of the Father. And He's going to bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I commanded unto you. You see, we've got to get ourselves tuned in and thinking this way so we know that God will teach us all these things. There's nothing that God will hold back from you. 
You can learn. That's why we see that he will bring us into the truth. Now we're going to jump over in 15. We'll come back into the, in the first part of it. But since we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we want to stay with us. In verse 26, look what it says. When the fathers come, whom I will send unto you, Jesus is involved in it. The other one said the father's going to send it, didn't it? This one says, I will send unto you from the Father. So again, in the divine chain of command, it's coming from the Father through the Son, coming down to us. Even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father. Where does the Holy Spirit come from? He comes from the Father. He is the Spirit of the Father. This is why the entire body of Christ, the great amount of them who haven't received the Holy Spirit, they got born again, but they shut off receiving the Spirit of the Father. And they're lacking something that's very important in their life, to do the works of God, to get revelation of the ways of the Father and the ways of the, to develop this personal, intimate fellowship with the Godhead. And so many of those, they just walk around in the flesh and they don't walk in the ways of the Spirit, nor do they see the power of God manifest. What are they lacking? They're lacking the Spirit of the Father. That's why the Holy Spirit is so important to help people to receive and that they need to receive the Holy Spirit in their life. Now we come over to John 16. We see further what he's going to do. We see down here in verse 13, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he's going to guide you into all truth. And this is the Spirit of the Father. See, when you understand that he says he'll guide you into all truth, that means you can be guided into all truth. That means you can know all truth. Don't think that you can't know things. In fact, we heard, I was just hearing, wife was praying, uh, playing this song, and we heard this guy on this song say, we'll never know the grace of God. We'll never understand the grace of God. And it just, I was just walking through, and I said, that's a lie. I heard that coming out of that song. And I said, that's a lie. That's not the truth whatsoever. You've got to watch what you hear and think that, well, that must be true. We'll never know. It's a big lie. We can know all these things. We can be guided into all truth. Notice the Holy Spirit. He shall not speak of himself. Whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Does that mean that the Holy Spirit originates things? No. He hears things from above. And he will show you things to come as well. God wants you to show you things to come through the Holy Spirit so you can always be one head step ahead of the devil. And God can always keep you in tune for what you need to know. He shall glorify me and he shall receive of mine and he shall show it unto you. This shows you the Spirit of the Father is so important to get into you so that he can manifest the work that he wants. We also see in John 15, 1, Jesus says, I'm the true vine. You and I get connected into the vine when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. You get a brand new spirit, don't you? My father's the husband. He's the pruner. He is doing this work to kind of clean you up so that you can bring forth fruit. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. That means if you don't bear fruit, you're going to be cut off. That's what that says. This old thing say, well, I got connected in the vine. I'm going to be there forever. That's a lie. If you don't bring forth fruit, he is going to take you away. Every branch that beareth fruit, that's someone who's been bringing fruit. How do you do that? Through the word. He purgeth it. This is talking about what the father's doing, remember. The Father is at work to cleanse you, to purge you. This is why we got to get into the cleansing mode, which is what? Deal with all sin, get rid of the fleshly works, and cast out all the demons to get free. He purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. As you go through the purging process, then you can bring forth more fruit. Without going through the purging process, you'll never come to the place of seeing more fruit come forth in your life. Well. Then the word is at work to bring the cleansing. You come to a place of abiding in him. The branch can't bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in him. You come to the place of abiding when you live and you dwell and you remain in him. Which, how do you do that? Through the word. Hearing and doing the word is the key. I am the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Now we come to the much fruit stage, which is when you come to the place of abiding in the Lord, living, remaining in Him. That's why we emphasize to you continually, and you're going to hear it continually in the future. The Word in your life is the key. 
in the measure that you have the Word that in you, abiding in you, operating in your life, hearing and doing across the board in all areas, bringing forth fruit, more fruit, much fruit in your life as you go through the purging process, that is developing a personal, intimate fellowship with the Lord. If a man abide not in me, this is quite a statement, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. God expects you to abide in him, which means you can't go back and then go off your own way and think that you're going to be in good shape. No. He wants you to abide in him. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, how are you going to abide in him? Because the words abide in you. Remember, what you do at the word, which is what you do at Jesus, is what allows the Father and Jesus to come and make their abode in you, coming to abide in you. And then he says, you shall ask, I tell you, demand of what's due you, what you will, which is what? According to the promises of God, which is what you're going to pray, the word. What you will is always going to be in line with the word because you're making a demand of what's due you from the word. That's why you pray the word. It shall be done unto you. That doesn't mean, well, we hope it'll be done. Maybe it'll be done. It shall be done. You need to have an absolute confidence that when you pray to the Father in the name of Jesus and you make a demand of what's due you, it's going to be done. God has promised and he's going to bring it to pass. But you know, you've got to come to the place of abiding in him. You can't think that you're going to get anywhere if you're abiding in sin. You're walking in sin. You're walking in the flesh. You've got one foot in the world. You're not even right with him to see any audience from the Father whatsoever. It's not going to happen. That's why these people that think that they can just walk around and do anything they want, everything's fine. They're totally deceived from the Word of God. Herein is my Father glorified. We're to glorify the Father. How do you glorify the Father? Not just praising and worshiping Him, but bearing much fruit and becoming a true disciple of the Lord. God wants us to bring forth much fruit. That's the way you glorify the Father. You glorify the Father in allowing His work to be accomplished in you through the Word of God. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. Again, we see the Father's love coming to Him, and then He was operating in that. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Again, we see how did Jesus abide in His love? He kept the Father's commandments. How are you going to abide in the love of God? By keeping my commandments, which is the commandments of Jesus Christ, which are given to us in the New Testament. That's why we've told you the commandments in the New Testament are of utmost importance. We took the time to go through all that in, what, seven different, eight different sessions or so. Because if you don't know the commandments of God and what you're expected to do in keeping them, abiding in them, how are you going to abide in His love? You're not going to. You think, well, I'm born again, and I'm a Christian, and everything's fine, and so, well, God loves me, and I know I'm abiding His love. That's a lie. That's deception. That's just believing, you know, I'm just going to believe such and such. People believe a lot of things. They just manufacture them in their mind. Are they looking at the Word of God? No. They're not even close, because they're out there in spiritual Lulu land, so to speak, just deciding whatever they want to decide. You know, we can't decide it's what we're going to believe. Well, I just believe such and such a way. I have people say that all the time. It doesn't matter what you believe or I believe. It only matters what the Word says. And if you and I aren't believing the Word, we're in trouble. We're out there just, go, you know, believing whatever we want to believe. And we've got all kinds of groups out there where we believe such and such. Well, the Word says this. Well, too bad. We believe such and such. We interpret it a different way, you know. we got all kinds of problems in the body of Christ. Why? Because they don't put the Word of God first place. Praise God. Here it says, you're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Is every Christian a friend of God? No. Only the ones who do what he commands. You're not a friend of God any more than the level of doing the commandments of God. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant not, knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I've called you friends for all things that I've heard of my Father, I've made known to you. Haven't we seen the emphasis over and over and over? Jesus saying everything that I've got has always come from the Father. I don't do a thing myself. Everything is all relationship with the Father, and all I'm doing is relaying it to you, and I've told you what all you're supposed to know to do. That's the same thing in our life. Everything that you do is nothing. It's everything that He tells you to do, everything that He reveals to you, everything that He is showing you because you deny yourself that counts. 
and all you are is a vessel for God to do everything that He wants. And what happens? As you do the Word, God's coming into you and God's doing the work. You can't do the work in your own self, but you do the work participating with Him, cooperating with Him as you allow Him to come. And what's happened simultaneously? As God's coming to do the work, He's developing a personal, intimate fellowship with you. You are knowing Him. You're going to know in the Father, you're knowing Jesus, you're knowing the Holy Spirit, and you're known of Him, and you're being changed into the very image of Jesus Christ. Because when He comes back, it talks about in 1 John, how we're, to be, we're going to be like Him. Well, how are you going to be like Him? Because of the work of God being accomplished in your life. That's how you're going to be like Him. And that's exactly what Jesus did, and that's exactly what He's teaching here continually. You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Your fruit should remain. Your fruit remains because you keep doing the word, isn't it? You could lose it if the devil takes the word out. What, that whatsoever you shall I tell, make a demand of what's due you, of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Again, all the promises of God belong to you. There isn't one promise that should fail us of entering into his rest. Remember what it says in Hebrews 4? We're to enter into everything that He has. See, you've got to understand what the Father purposes and what He wants to bring forth in your life. Praise God. He that hateth me hates my Father also. Same thing. Whatever you do with Jesus is your attitude toward the Father. You love Jesus, you love the Father. You hate the Word, how do you hate the Word if you don't do what He says? If I had not done among them the works that none other man did, then had they had not had sin, now have they both seen and hated both me and the Father. So he said, essentially, if you're hating Jesus by not doing what he said, you're hating not only him, but you're hating the Father. And again, that brings us to the point of realizing that what we do with the Word of God is the key in our life. And we'll, again, we'll close with these scriptures, which we saw previously, in John 16, 23, in prayer. And this is very important because you've got to learn how to pray. I would say 99.9% .9 of the body of Christ does not pray accurately. A lot of them are praying to Jesus, or they're praying to God, or praying to whatever they want to pray to. Or the ones that are praying to the Father in the name of Jesus, they're asking, requesting, petitioning. They're not making a demand of what's due them. They're not commanding the work of His hands. They're not saying, Kingdom, Come, making a command, as we saw this morning in Matthew chapter 6, for you who are here, and speaking all these things into being to bring them into manifestation. So you've got to understand what has happened in this covenant relationship. You are now in covenant relationship with Him. You have a covenant, all the promises belong to you, and now you make a demand of what's due you, and you speak all these things into being. How was Jesus upholding all things in His life? He spoke things into being. He commanded them all to come into being. And the Bible says in Isaiah 45, 11, we're to command the work of His hands. You are to command the work of His hands? That's right. Is that making God do anything? No. It's releasing Him to do it through you. But you give the command so that He can operate through you. So when you pray, are you commanding? Or are you going to keep on asking, requesting, and petitioning? You can ask and petition or request all you want. You're, you're, you're not doing things according to the New Testament. Your prayers aren't even going to get above the ceiling. They aren't going to get an audience with God. Because he said, in that day you shall ask, request of me nothing. Jesus is doing the speaking there. Verily, verily, I say unto you. He says, truly, truly, he's emphasizing it. Truly, truly, I say unto thee, whatsoever you shall, I tell you, make a demand of what's due you, of the Father, in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto, up to this time, have you made a demand of nothing in my name. Make your demand of what's due you by praying the word, and you shall take hold of it, lambano. You're to take hold of it. It is imperative that you learn how to pray accurately and effectively. Start taking hold of the promises as you're bringing the word and praying the word to the Father in the name of Jesus. What's going to happen? You're going to see all of them happen. Why would your joy get full? Because you're seeing all these promises coming to pass. Everything you pray, and it's happening here, and it's happening there. 
the joy is going to be so full on you, you're just going to be so excited because you see all the things that God's doing. Why should this happen? Because your prayers are seeing results. Because you're praying accurately according to the Word of God. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your Word that brings revelation of who you are. I see the divine command and the flow from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. I see that what I do at the Word, what I'm doing with Jesus, is going to affect the Father's attitude. So I am going to develop a personal intimate fellowship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. What I do with the Word is going to determine what the Father is going to do for me. And I have all the promises that belong to me. I now pray to the Father. He's the Most High. He is the top in the chain of command, in the Godhead. I can pray directly to Him in the name of Jesus. I can take hold of every promise and I can see it come to manifestation. I thank you, Father. I will always do what is in line with your word. I will bring forth fruit, and I will do things that glorify you, and I will allow you to come and abide in me and manifest yourself in me and through me. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I am going to see a personal, intimate fellowship be established with you, and I'm going to see all your works be accomplished in my life. I'm going to abide in you. I'm going to see you come and manifest yourself in my life. And I, as I do so, I will glorify you, and I will become like you because of the work you're going to do through the Word of God. Thank you, Heavenly Father. My eyes are going to be set to develop what you have said in my relationship with the Godhead so that I can become like you and do your mighty works in this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. A lot of stuff. We kind of went through it a little bit quick, but you could take those scriptures, go back and meditate through them and really see how Jesus did nothing of himself. He did everything that the Father told. And the same thing is true today. We're going to do all the things that Jesus says. And everything we do, that's bringing the Father to manifest himself in us. And you are going to develop this relationship with God. But remember, it all starts out with deny yourself. Crucify that flesh daily. Don't do anything of yourself. Jesus said, he, in fact, I don't, we didn't read that one scripture. I don't know why we jumped over it. I, think, I don't think we read this one, but I'll just bring it to you quickly. Jesus said in John 8, 29, He that sent me is with me, the Father that hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Wow. That's what you and I want to come to the place of doing. We just do always the things that please him. It means we never do anything of ourselves. We never do anything of the flesh. We don't do anything except for what the Word says. That is going to bring you into a place of fellowship, deep relationship with God. And He's going to manifest Himself. That is what God is going to accomplish in your life as you do the scriptures that we've seen. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. Thank you for the revelation of yourself and your, all the things that you want to accomplish and how you operate. Thank you that we're going to take hold of it we're going to do what you say, and we're going to see your word be performed and see this intimate fellowship be developed with you in our life. Thank you that you're going to come to the place of abiding in us and accomplishing the great work that you have purposed in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. we got some more to talk about Wednesday night. We're going to pick up from there, finish in John, go through the epistles, and 
Hopefully we'll get through that on Wednesday night. We'll see. There aren't that many. There's a tremendous number of scriptures in Matthew, as we saw, and in John. Much in there. Not as much in the rest of it, but we will go through that, and we should finish that up more than likely on Wednesday night. I trust this has helped you and got your focus on our Heavenly Father for all the things that He wants to do in your life. God bless. Be prayer. I invite you to come forward. You're dismissed. Any questions or whatever, be glad to answer. Sure. Yes.